In the Reading Corner today, looks like we've got a fun-packed half hour ahead of us because I'm talking to Jen Carney about her series of books, The Accidental Diary of Bug. First of all, a huge welcome into the Reading Corner. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Nikki. I'm delighted to be here. So we we are shortly going to be on book three of this series, but I want to do a little bit of probing, first of all, about uh, the books and how they're set up. And um, perhaps we ought to start, as it is called, The Accidental Diary of Bug, we ought to start with your main character. Okay. Now, it's her diary, basically. It is her diary. So, but, but do you know what? It wasn't supposed to be her diary. So she's got this thing where she's not really good at spellings and her mums give her this uh, jotter and say, here you go, you need to practice your spellings. But Billy being as she is, who kind of turns most situations around so they work in her favour, she immediately repurposes this spellings jotter into um, this stay awake doodle diary, she calls it, which she keeps um, at bedtime when she should be going to sleep. So yeah, she she writes in her diary when interesting things are going on or exciting things or when she's just got something she wants to reflect upon. And she's very silly and daft, but she's um, she's quite witty. Um, she can make the everyday quite funny. It's all very relatable, uh, very rooted in real life. Um, yeah, so she keeps this di- these these diaries and make interactive pages for readers to kind of get involved with and lots of kind of life observations. But alongside that, each book does tell a story as well. But yeah, they're, they're lots of fun, basically. Lots of games to play. And I did confess to you before we started recording uh, that one of the games in The Accidental Diary of Bug is she, she draws herself and she draws herself without a nose. And there's a selection of four noses for the reader to choose from. And very cleverly, once you've chosen that nose, you turn the page and it says, there you are, you've been picking your nose. <laughs> yeah, there are some really silly bits, you know, that I, I'm always silly with my children and all the things that they found really funny that I've done with them have kind of made it into the books in some way. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't explained why it's called Bug. So Billy's full name is Belinda Upton Green, and um, she's referred to as Billy throughout the book. Um, but uh, school are going through this phase where everybody's calling each other by their um, initials as a nickname, and obviously Billy Upton Green spells bug. She's not really fond of that, to be honest. She doesn't really want to be known as bug. In fact, it's one of the rules she sets out at the beginning of the book, don't ever call me bug. Um, but it's a funny thing that goes through the stories. Something when I go into schools that the children like to talk about, um, and I ask them anybody if anybody's got a name, like Penelope, Olivia, Orwell, or anything, <laughs> Just really silly things like that. Mm. Anyway, I think we need to find out, before we get into the stories, I think we need to find out a bit more about you. And so I've got some questions for you. And the first one I need to know, I judge everybody by their answer to this question, just so you okay. know. I need to know, what's your favourite biscuit? Oh, that is a changeable feast for me, you know. Uh, I know there's a big theme of biscuits in my books, which, you know, is drawn from real life. One of my favourite biscuits is a Tunnock's tea cake because I'm a big fan of dismantling biscuits. And there's a big opportunity for that with a Tunnock's tea cake. So I am, um, you know, you peel off that dome of chocolate and then you've got all that goop in the middle that you can enjoy before you have the biscuit base, you know. So I'll go with the Tunnock's tea cake, I think. How about you? I'm a custard cream and I think, I mm. think bug. I think Billy. She loves a custard cream. She loves a custard cream. She loves a custard cream as long as, you know, there's the thing going through the books of the biscuit laws and it, it goes through the whole series actually. So in the first book, she introduces the biscuit laws that she sets up this club with her two best friends and they're very particular about how biscuits should be eaten. And the, the custard cream falls into law number one about, you know, thou must remove the top layer and scrape out the cream with thy teeth and and all sorts of other ones. Um, But um, in book two, the prime minister gets involved in the biscuit laws and suggests a rule. And in book three, when you get to the end of book three, there are actually 12 biscuit laws that um, have to be obeyed if you want to be part of TOBLA, the official biscuit law association. (laughs) So another question for you. What's your favourite word? Everybody's got a favourite word. Do you know I like, um, let's go with a kerfuffle. That's a good one. Kerfuffle. Yeah, any word that's like to teachers use and you think, what are they talking about? I'll go with kerfuffle. Kerfuffle. Billy's got a list of words. I like her list of words as well. 
She does. She likes words, even though she's even though she doesn't like spelling. She's really smart in all her own ways, and um, it kind of proves this series that you know you can be not the best at spelling. I'm not the best at spelling either, and still be quite smart and creative and imaginative. And yeah, she comes up with a list of words that kind of tickle her tongue, which is a chain also a changeable feast. Because when somebody mentions a word that she thinks, oh, I've not heard that word before, the words on her original list are usurped, and the list at the end ends up as a totally different list. She likes rude words as well. <laughs> They get cut off the rude ones sometimes. Oh, they do, don't they? Yeah, I think I think uh, Willie Willie is cut, which is a funny thing. <laughs> and she quite likes at the top of her list uh, is spawn. That's a good yeah. word. Spawn's yeah. a good word, and it's a it's a it's a today word, isn't it? With uh, Minecraft and things and getting spawned into imaginary lands that children always play in. Yeah, indeed. Now, cat or dog? Cat. Cat. I used to think I was a dog person, you know, and I've always had dogs growing up. Um, we recently lost our dog, which was very sad. We have a cat as well. And um, cats are very easy. When you've got three children, having a cat is a lot easier than having a dog. <laughs> very independent creatures. And our cat's very loving and affectionate. So I think I might have transferred my allegiance. Might be cat now. Yeah, but Billy's got a dog. She does. She loves her dog, Mr. Paws. Having an animal in a story... It always gives you a bit of a warm feeling, I think. You you kind of feel good about a character that is affectionate towards an animal. Oh, yeah, I suppose you're right. Yeah, it, it gives a sense of home and family and what's going on, doesn't it? She also has three fish, doesn't she? Um, we've had lots of animals. When I started writing this series, we had a quite a menagerie of um, uh, hamsters and um, fish and all sorts. But, do you know, now... We only have a cat left. That's the sad thing about it at the moment. We've only a cat. Last question, and then we get on to some serious business. Favourite okay. colour? Green. Ooh. And do you know what? I didn't call Billy, Billy Upton Green, thinking about my favourite colour, but green has always been my favourite colour. And uh, my wife tells me, you only like green because you always like the underdog and you always like the things that nobody else will pick. But I think green's a lovely colour. It's so nature and grass and countryside. Um, but I don't like green sweets. That's a bit odd, isn't it? OK, so green is your favourite colour. Unlucky to wear at a wedding, apparently. Oh, would you wear a black? Would you wear a black bridesmaid's dress? Like Billy, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think I would. But I think I would allow my daughter to choose black if that's what she wanted. Because yeah. I'm a big believer in freedom of choice with things like that. <laughs> Billy doesn't get away with a black bridesmaid dress, though. <laughs> Let's talk about her family a little bit more. She's adopted, first of all. So... Let's talk a little bit about that, because I know this is something that you have personal experience of. Now, a few years ago, I run a, a reading club and we select books that uh, and schools buy these books um, and conduct the reading club in school. Mm. And one year we'd chosen these books. Uh, they were all good books in their own right. But we'd done something that we didn't realise until later when an adoptive parent yeah. said to us, do you realise that three of these books have adopted children in right. and none of them has a positive image of a not, oh, you know, right. it was all like okay. the, the wicked adopted yeah. who didn't really treat the child well kind of thing. Yeah, And the impact of obviously putting those three books next to each other, okay. they might have been okay on their own, but it was not a good thing. Okay, to yeah. Together. Mm. And then it started me thinking about, well, where are the positive stories with adopted children in yeah what's your experience been well do you know what um yeah I have three children all adopted uh, by myself and my wife and um the reason I started to write this series was was because of something my son said so he was a very reluctant reader and um finally when he was probably about 11 started to find a little bit of pleasure in very funny accessible illustrated books often told in diary style um and that was brilliant and then one night he said to me what mum but why in this type of like funny fiction are there never any characters who have two mums or who were adopted and I thought mm, I'm not quite sure so I, I had a mission to try and find one and like you say I couldn't find anything that was upbeat and positive um, which is you know our children's are very happy children in in their family 
Um, so that's what started me writing this, really. I, need, I needed to make it really accessible and I wanted a massively positive experience because our experience of books featuring adoption, lots of picture books we had about adoption, mm. lots of non-fiction books. But often, like you say, the, some, some of the more story-based books were a bit depressing and, and told it in a very negative light. Or they were a bit too over the top in, oh, my God, you're so special because you're adopted. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted an ordinary story where it's not the massive focus of the story, but it's Mm -hmm. there because that's real life, you know, um, and real life families are very different. You know, lots of families are different these days. So, yeah, I wanted it to be really lighthearted and upbeat. But whilst having these messages of about difference and different families and um, not judging people too quickly and accepting everything. So, so yeah, um, I'm glad that you've mentioned that they have this positive spin because um, some adoptive parents have been in touch with me to say, you know, this is really good. I can give this to my child and it represents them without triggering something too sensitive in them. It's just a, a celebration of, oh, this is me and I like it. One of the things that I, I like, you know, she's sort of got a nemesis, Billy, in this yes, story, she, she has. Um, Janie. Uh, the, you know, the perfect girl. She'd have just the right bubbles in her hair, wouldn't yes. she? And yeah. I like the way that you use her in a way to explain things about Billy's family because she doesn't really understand. And in a way, you're talking to the child reader, but in a very approachable way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was um, that was my intention. So, yeah, Janie joins Billy's class as um, a new girl. So whereas all Billy's friends have grown up with her from reception to now, knowing all about her family background and nothing's a, a, de- a big deal or any kind of deal, it's all new for Janie. So she does um, ask a lot of questions, um, which Billy's perfectly happy to answer, but Janie kind of probes deeper and, you know, says things that, you know, as a mum to actual adopted children get asked of my children like um where's your real mom and who which one of these is your real mom and where's your dad and all these so it's kind of just trying to explore that and um telling it from the child's perspective and um you know arming children maybe with responses they can give (laughs) but it's not done in any worthy way I think that's the important no not at all and worthiness out of it it's not at all. I'm trying not to do that. And Janie's not malicious in any way. She's just um, curious and trying to find things out. And um, and at some point maybe says things because she's trying to fit in with the rest of the class um, and because um, she's new and that's understandable. And Billy kind of comes to understand that as well, that that's, that's where, where she's coming from with her questions. Mm. Um, but, yeah, the, through that relationship, the, the family dynamic, Billy's family dynamic is explored mm. and um, it helps Janie when something happens in her family life that something's revealed about Janie's family and she's got Billy mm. as a support system then. It's good stuff. Um, I haven't had the opportunity yet to read book three. I think it's called Sister Act. It is. But I understand there's going to be a new addition in the family So how is that different, having a new adoptive child in the family? And what were you exploring through that book? Really, um, it's an exploration of how, you know, for an adult, the adoption process does take a long time. So for a child who's already placed waiting for a sibling or even seeing if it will happen, that's massive. It's it's massively lengthy. It's quite um, daunting. It's very frustrating in that it takes a long time and through Billy kind of, she's, she's worrying, will I say the wrong thing? Will I do something that's going to mean that my sister won't be able to come and live with us? Um, so she has those worries. So it's about that, about the adoption of her birth sibling. One of the things that I wanted to ask you is, I know that you've been a teacher and actually uh, one of the things we're very concerned about as teachers is, you know, making sure that all children are treated equitably that we don't raise issues in the classroom necessarily that are going to be a bit challenging or a bit difficult for some children. You know, if we're doing things about family trees, for instance, yeah. what do you do if you've got adopted children in your class? Mm-hmm. Um, what sorts of things would you say are important for teachers to think about? Um, I think giving a heads up to the adoptive parents, if you're going to do something on family trees so that the you know a chat can happen at home and you see what the child is comfortable with we're going to do a family tree about our family 
but with mentioning I was adopted, you know, my children would be perfect. I'm, we're very open and, and I, that's the way we are. They would be very happy, for example, to say this were, these were my birth parents. This is my family now. And here's the family, the family tree from my, the family that I'm in now. Um, and I think just that heads up so that the, the conversations can happen at home is, um, is a big part of it. Things that used to bug me were when teachers would say to children, like, go and ask your dad's this, that kind of thing, you know. And I think just that kind of small thought about language and uh, parents is that both parents and guardians is, is a perfectly acceptable term that people all understand. <laughs> Absolutely. Which takes us into thinking about the other aspect of, of the family situation, and that is that Billy has two mums. And until recently, that really wasn't in evidence in children's books either. No, and um, like I said, that was one of my um, kind of starting points with the book when my son was mentioning, you know, nobody ever has two mums or two dads. So that was really important for me to bring it out um, in in the books. And, and I think it's getting better in literature in general mm. that um, same-sex parents are represented. And I think it's really important, and it's not just for the children who have two mums or two dads or whatever. Um, it's equally important, I think, for... Um, all children to read about the different families that make up the world and to kind of understand that all families are normal and that, you know, that's somebody's family and that's their normal um, and to kind of broaden their knowledge really of the world and who lives in it. It was my daughter who gave me the push to try and get these books published when she read the manuscript because it had been in my loft since my son had read what I wrote been in my loft for a few years and it was her she read it and it wasn't the representation of her having two mums and being adopted that that was the biggest thing for her it was I wish that everybody in my class could read this book so that they can see kind of how very similar our family is to everybody else's yeah that's that's really interesting isn't it it's as much Mm. about commonalities as it is about differences I know that another thing that really um, is an interest of yours is the reluctant reader. I don't particularly like the term reluctant reader myself because I think once, you know, you would hope, wouldn't you, that when a child gets hold of your book, they're not going to be reluctant anymore. So it's about the labelling, I don't mind, but I understand the behaviour that actually for some children, they're not drawn initially to books to pick them up and read them, but we can turn them into avid readers yeah it's we more give it's them more, the right things <laughs> exactly so it's about readers who haven't found that book that floats their boat rather than being uh, reluctant yeah that's why yeah. I always say when I go into schools about you know do, never stop opening books because the next one you pick up could be that one that really starts your reading for pleasure journey but yeah I was trying to appeal to readers like my son who it's not the thing that they would choose to do to pick up a book and read um so that's why it's littered with like interactive pages and uh, doodles and ideas for games. And it's all distractions from reading that my son would find distractions anywhere but read while well, they're all in the book. <laughs> so you can still be distracted while you're reading. And the children perhaps don't pick out that when they're following a decision chart of where what's my ideal cake, still doing a lot of reading there. And it's still relevant to what's going on in the story. So that was my idea, really, to kind of keep them entertained as as well as tell a story. And um, it, it seems to be working. I've had lots of good feedback from teachers whose children have not been inclined to read, um, have really found pleasure in um, in these books. Yeah, so I'm really pleased about that. Mm. Reading by stealth. And that's often yeah. the case with these diary format books. You know, I was talking to Liz Peach on the other day. Very similarly, you know, the amount of reading that you're doing to read a book like this. Yeah. If you were to sit and count the words, I don't know. How, do you know how many words there are in your books? Well, discounting like speech bubbles and um, pictures, which do take up a lot of words. I think there's just about there's between 20 and 25,000 in each book. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's no mean reading feat. To, no, think, it's not at all, no. So I think that's, you know, that in itself is really interesting. But I do find that gatekeepers can sometimes be a bit sniffy about the diary book with lots it's of drawings a, yeah. in it. Maybe not so much now, I hope. 
it's a, it's a big shame, I always think, when, when that happens because, you know, you're denying your child this. My books, they are really daft and they are very accessible, but they have really good messages and um, deeper things going on in them. So um, it saddens me to think that somebody would open it and think, oh, no, it's too easy or, oh, no, it's too silly because uh, it's children love <laughs> um, these kind of books. And humour actually does require quite a bit of cognitive processing to understand I, a joke it's not an I, easy thing I agree yeah there's a lot of inference to be drawn from some of the things in it and um, they're accessible but they're not like oh dead simple and easy they still got get your children thinking about things like you say it does take something to kind of understand the the jokes and the situations and the irony of things that are going on Absolutely. So I'd love to know, you know, if we could encapsulate it quite briefly for our listeners, what the main stories are in each of the three books. So in book one, um, the story is about what happens when a new girl joins Billy's class. And very soon after that, things start to go missing from the school. Big things like a teacher's purse um, is stolen. And as this new girl is proving to be a bit of a best friend stealer already. She's very high on the list of culprits um, Billy suspects of being the purse thief. There's lots of other things going on as well, but that's kind of book one storyline. Book two, uh, basically famous, is about what happens when um, Billy's class are invited to star in a television advert about school uniforms. And so it's the highs and lows of that and a couple of brushes with fame um, that Billy has uh, with this continuing turbulent relationship between Billy and Janie the the new girl who keeps getting in the way of Billy's glory and causing friendship rifts and throughout basically famous the mystery there is um, Billy's trying to get to the bottom of this huge secret that her mums appear to be keeping from her so that's book two now in book three um Billy and her class are putting on a musical show. So there's rivalry for the roles and even a bit of a sabotage. And at the same time, as we've discussed, Billy and her mums are trying to adopt Billy's baby sister, which brings a lot of frustrations for Billy, mainly because it takes a long time. And the mystery in the third one involves the surprising identity of um, Billy's great nan's boyfriend's nephew. <laughs> I like phrases like that. Um, they all have a little mystery to solve for the children as well as all this comedy going on. Really interesting, exciting and uh, obviously looking forward to seeing what else might be around the corner for Bug. But you you said right at the beginning that you sort of found yourself accidentally writing for <laughs> children. Now that you are an established <laughs> children's writer, what yeah. do you enjoy most about the job? I enjoy the just the creativity, to be honest. I like to make up new characters. I'm a bit of a personality thief, so I'll steal a bit of people here and there and try and inject them into my stories. Um, I like chatting with my own children about what actually they find funny and what they say, no, that's not funny, Mum, don't put that in. <laughs> Equally, I like connecting with children, so I've done lots of Zooming over the past few months and um, I've just started to go into schools and that's always really nice to kind of get that connection with children and you know demonstrate some biscuit eating with them and um, just have lots of fun really it's just nice to be able to write things that children can connect with and possibly hopefully fingers crossed start some people's like reading for pleasure journey fantastic well Jen it's been I knew it was going to be a ball talking <laughs> to you today and it has been thank you so much for joining me in the reading corner oh absolutely my pleasure thanks for having me in the Reading Corner is presented by Nikki Gamble and produced by Alison Hughes. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please do leave a review for us. To find out about other projects, including an audience with events and the Exploring Children's Literature Summer School, visit www.exploringchildrensliterature.uk. Join us again soon in the Reading Corner on your favourite podcast platform. <laughs>